Hello, Jane. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming out and braving this um, Pull this over. Is this wild better? Melbourne heat and wind. Oh, yes. Thank you very much for that. Um, my name's David Francis. I'm uh, originally Australian, um, and I'm a novelist, and I've been living overseas for many, like, 40 years. And I'm, we were just talking about escaping America, and I've maybe escaped and come back. Um, and it's a great treat for me to be here. Before we get cracking, um, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet today on the lands of the Wurundjeri, Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place. And we acknowledge any First Nation people with us today. Uh, we pay our respects to their elders, past and present. Uh, and Jane, I remember when I, about 15 years ago, when I came back for the Melbourne Writers' Festival and I heard that acknowledgement of country the first time, I was kind of deeply moved by mm -hmm. it. And, I'm, and I feel like in the context of recent history, um, it feels somewhat hollow. But we do it a little bit in the States, mm. but not much. Even in LA at book festivals, we do that acknowledgement just to the um, Native American tribes, but it's not very established in America, so we're a little ahead yeah. on that front, I guess. Well, um, we, need a lot, we in America need a lot of training, and I hope we get it before it's too late. Well, I wasn't going to talk about that right off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's not talk about that. Right? Let's, let's talk not. about something more positive. Let's, let's talk about you and your work. Um, <laughs> uh, Jane Smiley, uh, I should use your full name, um, Pulitzer Prize winning author Jane, Smi <laughs> Jane Smiley. She, ch she changed her name in 1992, I think, to that. It's a little bit, a bit of a hyphenate, but um, um, her fiction ranges in setting from a farm in Iowa, uh, a novel I'm sure most of you know, to medieval Greenland, to Hollywood, to Paris, and recently to Monterey, California and in subject matter ranging from family to environmental integrity, social institutions, political uh, and I guess economic dynamics and the struggle for women to find their identities, often in um, harsh and unreceptive environments. <laughs> um, Jane's focus is both historical and very contemporary, providing fresh insights into the ethos and direction of American life and history and elsewhere and and everywhere and everything, having written <laughs> so many. I think Jane has written, I looked it up in Wikipedia, and I'm not sure they're all there, but I counted 30, 33, but then I remembered you wrote a book called 20 Yawns oh, that yeah. wasn't listed there. <laughs> I don't which is, count that one. <laughs> That's a book for small children. And it's to, you know, one and a half year olds, is to put them to sleep. And on every page, the characters are yawning. It's a genius and idea, though. Supposedly, it works. You know, people buy it and say, "Yeah, it worked." It's a bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't a bestseller. I wish. <laughs> um, but can we first delve into the extraordinary um, breadth and variety um, of your works? I mean, seventeen novels. I, you know, I. Um, tool away at a novel a time, <laughs> one thing at a time, and it takes me numerous years, mm. you seem to be able to manifest a non-fiction thing here and a novel and then a young adult novel. How does that all fall into place in your mind and your, and your work? Well, I, I'm, I'm a very curious person. And I grew up reading. And when I was very young, I read The Bobsy Twins and Nancy Drew with a with a flashlight under my um, blanket. And then I went to a very good high school where we had to read much more complicated things like Charles Dickens and Nathaniel Hawthorne. And um, somehow it all that meshed and it got me really interested. I also grew up in a family of storytellers. And I, and I tell this story often. So we'd be sitting around the living room, and my grandparents and my aunts and uncles would tell some story from their background. And they always made it both interesting and amusing. And then I would go into the kitchen to get a glass of water, and one of them would come follow me and say, now that's not, way, that's not how it really happened. This is how it really <laughs> happened. And they didn't have hostility toward one another. They just wanted their own viewpoints. Uh -huh. 
And so when someone comes to you when you're seven or eight years old and they're telling things from other people's viewpoints, then you understand that everybody sees things differently. And it sounds like you had uh, an intense connection with the classics early on. I'm, I'm someone for well, whom, as a reader and a writer, the classics don't always resonate in a way that mm -hmm. they seem to for you. you. You wrote 13 Ways of Looking at a Novel, mm -hmm. which explores um, from the tale of Genji mm -hmm. to a contemporary novel and through all the classics. Those works, Dickens and Proust and Balzac, they're like all in your bailiwick. Well, I was introduced to the classics starting in seventh grade. Mm -hmm. And probably the first... Um, the first true classic I read was Oliver Twist, and I didn't understand a word of it. Um, and yeah, The Scarlet Letter, I understood most of that. Um, then in eighth grade, we had to read another Dickens novel. It might have been Hard Times. I don't remember which one it was. I maybe understood three words of that. But I was a good girl. You know, I was a good student. I did my homework. I scratched my head a lot, but I tried to, you know, do what I was supposed to do. And you didn't find Dickens sort of overwrought and boring, it doesn't sound like. No. I just found him not very understandable, <laughs> especially compared to Jane Austen, because I was reading oh, right. Jane Austen at the right. same time. Right. And then in ninth grade, and this was a turning point for me, um, we were assigned David Copperfield, which was longer than those others. We had two weeks to read it. And I put it off and put it off and put it off. And finally, on Saturday morning before it was due on Monday, I sat down in the basement and started to read it. And I read it in two days. So are you an extraordinary... And I understood it perfectly from beginning to end. Are you, are you, have you always been a fast reader? And a, are you a fast writer? I've always been a dedicated reader. And I wouldn't say I'm a fast writer. I'd say I'm a steady writer. Mm -hmm. um, I try to, you know, when I'm working on a novel, I try to write about uh, 1,500 words a day, sometimes as much as 2,000. When I was working on the uh, trilogy, um, the last 100 years trilogy, I would do 1,000 words a day for maybe a couple of months, and then I'd up it to 2,000 words a day. Because I found that as I knew more, then I got all the more sort of energized by what was in the book, and so I'd write more. And there are some books, The Greenlanders is a perfect example for me, where I scratched my head for the first 50 pages. I had no idea what I was doing. I wanted to write about medieval Greenland, I wanted to use an archaic style. And um, I had to go back and forth trying to figure it out. And then all of a sudden, it just came, went and it came out. It was as if it was being fed to me from before. So from that spell before, from. you kind of fell into writing the Greenlanders, yeah. was, that a, was that a once off in that world? Because I in, know, for example, with a Thousand Acres, mm -hmm. you were a little bit um, directed by King Lear because Absolutely. it's based on that More structure. more than a little bit. A yeah. lot. And, yeah. and you've written various novels that have been derived from mm -hmm. plots of, of the Decameron, for example, yeah. for um, uh, The Hills. What's... Um, Ten Days in the Ten Hills. Ten Days in the Hills. Um, that's probably Way not... too much sex in that one. Too much sex? If you... Oh, I, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that was one of my favorites because I, um, I, I was writing 13 ways of looking at the novel, and that came as a result of 9-11. A lot of novelists in the States uh, after 9-11 said, well, whatever I'm writing, this is pointless. And so I decided to go and back and read novels from the beginning. So I started with The Tale of Genji. And I ended up reading The Decameron, which I'd heard of but never read. And I thought, this is really interesting. All these people in the midst of the plague converse, conversing, you know. And then I didn't, had never heard before of the Heptameron, which was Marguerite of Navarre's rewrite of The Decameron. But since it was written during the Reformation, 
the conversations that they had about each other's stories were much more incisive and insightful. And I, th I realized that um, the novel was about learning about the inner lives of characters and, and the writer being interested in the inner lives of the characters. And then as the novel progressed um, through Dickens, through Trollope, um, through Henry James, all those characters, all those people, through Jane Austen, the inner life of the characters became a real, the thing that people learned from reading novels, mm -hmm. the thing that I had learned mm -hmm. as, um, as a child and as, an, uh, as a teenager. And so I became to love the nature of fiction even more than that and because of that. I, I think I noticed that since the year 2000, you have published more than 20 works one way or another, which mm -hmm. seems like an extraordinary accomplishment to me. <laughs> um, but the tone of those works is also varied. You have the, the trilogy, mm -hmm. um, which are three separate novels all following one family through a 100, 100 years, years yeah. um, which is pretty, pretty serious and intense on the mm -hmm. whole in tone. And then we go more recently to um, what's in, in Australia and the UK called um, The Strays of Paris. Mm -hmm. um, in the US, it's called Perestroika in, in Paris. Paris. Could you just tell us the little story of how <laughs> those names worked? Well, the, in, in 2008, let me, let me tell, say one thing ahead of time, and that is that when I was growing up and I read a lot of Shakespeare, I noticed that he liked writing comedies, romances, tragedies, and I thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I took so many um, courses in the Icelandic sagas that I also wanted to write an epic. So starting- How, how many of you have taken courses in the Icelandic <laughs> saga? Whoa, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, but I remember when I, I, I always wanted to rewrite King Lear from the point of view of Goneril and Reagan, but I knew I had to practice. And I think sometime maybe in my mid-20s, I decided that I wanted to do what Shakespeare had done, which is to write a comedy, a tragedy, mm -hmm. a, an epic, and a romance. And I knew that A Thousand Acres was the tragedy, and I knew that The Greenlanders was the epic. Mm -hmm. And then I read um, the English writer David Lodge, and mm -hmm. I saw that the comedy was going to take place at a land-grant university. And so that was Moo. And then um, the romance, well, I, in, I looked into what the nature of romance is, and early romance wasn't about love, it was about exploration and travel. And so that was the all true travels and adventures of Liddy Newton, which takes place in Kansas. And then I got obsessed with horse, thoroughbred horses and horse racing, and I did the, possibly the worst thing you could ever do, which is start breeding my own race horses. And um, that led to horse heaven, where there's a tragic horse, a comic horse, an epic horse, um, a, a romance horse, but also a realistic horse. And a Jack Russell. And a Jack, oh yes. <laughs> there has to be a Jack Russell if there's a horse. Um, and so it's just that I've always been really interested in and curious about different forms. I've liked to read them, so I mm -hmm. figure, well, why not try and mm -hmm. write them? So where does uh, The Strays of Paris fit into that? Well, it's, it's a sort of romance, comedy uh, well, it's, hybrid. It, yeah, I would say so. It, so that is a book about a, horse, a racehorse who's been, just had a race in Otoy, at Otoy. And she pushes against... We're, we're in Paris, obviously. Yeah, we're in, outside of Paris. And she's won the race. And she put, it's late in the evening, and her, <laughs> her groom has gone off to go to the bathroom. And Paris says, and why not in the stall? She doesn't understand that. 
<laughs> um, but she pushes against the stall door, and the stall door opens. And one of the things I say is, or I write is, she was, Paris was a curious filly. Now, this is based on a horse that I have named Paris Stroika, and she is a curious filly. And so she leaves, uh, the, she leaves the race course and goes into Paris and ends up in the, in the Place du Trocadero on the west side of the Seine. And I thought, this is totally ridiculous, and I can't stop working on it. And, and it's an absolute joy to read. I, I am someone who's not big on anthropomorphizing anything. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, God, here we go. Um, when the, because there's, a, there's a, um, two, a pair of mallards and a German pointer. The names are Sid and Nancy. And a, and a, and a rat, and, uh, two rats. and a crow called Raoul. A raven, um, excuse a, a you. A raven, excuse me. <laughs> um, it was a while ago I read. Um, and so all these characters appear in the, in the Champ de Mar. And I just imagine you, Jane, being in that part of Paris, walking through the mm -hmm. Champ de Mar and deciding where where could a horse hide out yep. here? I like it's it. winter, it's big enough, maybe it's dark enough. And yeah. I, I would love to see the documentary of you of you <laughs> like walking through Paris deciding where the, the butcher shop and the baker is that that appears in, in the novel. And it's really, I will say, a total delight and a sort of tour de force and it came right after and the can you imagine how many times i was required to go back to paris and look around to, for, to make Poor sure you'd done me. it right oh. <laughs> yeah no it was a real pleasure to to write and i i love it and it came out right at the time of a certain election yes i recall that so it was kind of an antidote in a way to the election and you did you write it consciously knowing what was happening no, in the I had, world? Or? I kind of set it aside. And mm -hmm. then I picked it up and looked at it again. And then um, sometime in 2019, I called my editor and I said, you know, this could be a kind of a distraction if you published it around that particular time. And they said, oh, that's you said a good yes. idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, needing all the distractions we, need, we can get. Um, the role of animals is quite profound. You and I first met when um, Horse Heaven came mm -hmm. out. must have been around 2001 or two yes. at the Sydney Writers' Festival, and I'd written a, a vaguely horsey novel, and we were on panels together, and I remember you were just saying, how, how, we met in No, we met in the elevator. In the lift. Yeah, um, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and I thought, oh, my God, there's Jane Smiley, and I'm on a panel with her. And I complimented her because I come from a chronically horsey situation <laughs> here in Australia. Um, I, I complimented her on the way she described a horse's front leg, which I thought was very impressive and not necessarily easy to do, oh, and made me so think happy. that, oh, she's the real thing. Um, and then we have gotten on famously mm -hmm. ever since. Do we, do we say gotten? I remember no one ever said gotten in Australia, but I've been hearing it a bit more recently. Anyway, back to the role of animals. So, you, so Horse Heaven obviously was populated by horses mm -hmm. and a dog, and then you wrote a non-fiction book, um, A Year, Year at, at the, the Races. races yeah. um, and then obviously The Strays of Paris mm -hmm. is heavily populated by animals, and I know they form a big part of your life. Mm -hmm. um, can you I also wrote um, some... Uh, YA right. books um, about a, a, a young woman who's growing up on a horse farm. So the first five are about this young woman who's been on a horse farm her whole life, and she's and she has to learn a new way of teaching her students how to ride. And then the next three are about one of her students who is basically me, who totally wants a horse but her parents can't afford it. They don't live in a horsey area. And um, one of the things I loved about her, and this was never true about me, is she's contrary. And so... <laughs> Not you at all. It was fun to write about this young girl who does it her way. Not to make this about me, but didn't I appear a young version of me? Yes. In, in which, what one of those? Which I think it was in um, the the one uh, one uh, ones about the older girl. Um, oh, the, no, I don't. Yeah, I can I can picture the cover. 
I can too. Yeah. I, 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 you sent me a copy. Anyway, um, what's interesting about, I have to get the name right because it's different here, um, The Strays, Strays of, of Paris, Paris yeah. um, is that there are no, um, there are no villains. There are no, there's no evil character in, in that whole, are you sick of talking about this? But I'm no. sure you've been asked it before. <laughs> but it's kind of fascinating that there's no, there isn't really a darkness and it's such a, a treat to read something that that doesn't have um, an underside. Well, they uh, the darkness is in the question about whether they'll survive and what's going to happen to That's them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, all of them have had some issues, especially the dog who had been um, owned by a local busker. Right. But he has died, and she's on her own now. Mm -hmm. um, the horse doesn't know what she's doing in Paris. Um, the, uh, the two main human characters are an extremely old woman who's almost 97 and her great grandson who's only about 10 and they, they have a fair amount of money but it's, the question is whether she's going to survive right. and what will happen to him. So I didn't want there to be a bad person. I wanted to, this to be about the survival of these animals and these people who have a lot to deal with and put up with. Mm -hmm. I remember the New York Times said, if, if you're looking for an escape, try this. That was <laughs> the endorsement of, this, of, the, of the novel. Um, and I, I remember um, uh, um, this, the Raoul, the, um, oh, the raven. crow, the graven, sorry, um, who's very kind of haughty and pithy and a really interesting character who sort of carries the wisdom of the novel in a way and I well he's one of you know one of the funny things or the fun things of being in Paris and doing all that research was listening to all of the ravens cawing and cawing and cawing all the time and I thought okay this is this raven is never going to shut up <laughs> and I turned in the first draft and my uh, and my editor said, basically, he's got to shut up at some point. So he had to, he actually had to learn something. Right. Um, and then moving on to more recent times, and I, I know that um, The Strays of Paris is um, on sale here tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you, Paperback. For, yes. <laughs> <laughs> for supporting writers and events such as this. And yes. more, more recently, and I, I hope and assume it has the same um, title in Australia, is um, your most recent novel, although you have one coming out this year, um, A Dangerous Business, uh, which is set in 1850s Monterey, mm -hmm. California, uh, and is... Uh, an historic novel in a sense. It, mm -hmm. it strikes me a little bit, I don't know how you see the relationship between the true tales and adventures of Liddy Newton, which is, I mm -hmm. think, set in a similar era in a different part of America. Yes, in Kansas. But in Kansas. So this is in Northern California, um, in Monterey, which is a historically interesting city and was once uh, for a minute the capital of California. Um, and it's uh, set uh, partially in a, in a brothel at, yes. in that era. Um, well, do you the want two to main characters work in a brothel. So can you, do you want to tell us a little bit about Eliza and Jean? Well, it starts with Eliza, whose parents are covenanters back in um, Michigan. And they've basically kept her very isolated her whole life. She doesn't have any, any siblings. And they... they um, they basically marry her off to a guy who passes through town who thinks they have a lot of money. And he pretends to be similar to them in religion. But uh, when he takes Eliza away to California, he turns out to be quite abusive. And so he's in a bar in Monterey, and he gets shot. And she's not sorry. A woman comes up to her hands her a piece of paper with a, her name on it and says, if you need anything, please come to me. And she goes thinking maybe she just needs some money. She does not want to go back to Michigan. She does not want to go back into the, into her, um, the house of her parents. Um, 
and it turns out that there's a brothel. But this woman is very kind, and she's very organized, and she knows how she wants the brothel to operate. And so Eliza, who's been sexually trained by her husband, says, why not? And so um, she actually finds all of the men, or almost all of the men that she beats in the brothel to be much more kindly to her than her husband was. Mm -hmm. And then, and then she runs into Jean, and Jean is slightly older than she is and uh, works in a brothel for women, and they become good friends. Can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, in, the, in this novel there are killings, and, the, yeah. and these two women sort of go on an adventure as, uh, as um, amateur detectives, mm -hmm. I guess. Well, I would say that... Eliza is nervous about what could happen. And I would say that Jean is one of those, if Jean were a man or if she were you know, 20 years younger than she is, she would have become a detective. She's very strong. She's um, very brave. And she wants to know. She wants to put these killings to rest. Now, in Monterey at this point, they don't. They have a sheriff, but they don't really have any kind of system. And if somebody important is killed, then the vigilantes get together and go after the killer. But they don't consider the the girls important. And so Eliza and Jean know that if someone's going to find the killer, it has to be them, because it's not going to be anybody else. So that in some respects, it's a a feminist and political. Oh historical God. novel. Was that an offensive yes. thing to say? Yes? The answer is yes. <laughs> no. can you, can yes, you... I want it to be. Yeah. You know, I want them to be independent. I want them to understand the world that they live in and how to survive in it. And they ha in order to do that, they have to think for themselves. Can you talk a bit about... I was imagining you walking around Paris researching... Um, uh, that novel, and now mm -hmm. this novel, uh, A Dangerous Business, I imagine you walking around Monterey oh. and sort of imagining oh. it in that era. Oh, yeah. And in, it, both of those novels are in winter. So yeah. in, in Monterey, it's like muddy and no roads, mm -hmm. no, no bitumen, um, and fairly hazardous in some ways. Well, in some ways. But um, Monterey was quite interesting in the 1850s. And the great thing about setting a a uh, historic novel in Monterey is that all, so many of the buildings and the landscape are very similar to the, they were then, to what they were then. So you can walk around Monterey, or I could, and just get this feeling of what it was like to be living there in the 1850s. Um, but, you know, I had resources. I went to the Monterey historical history room at the... Um, public library, and um, I asked the Monterey history guy to read through it, and he did. Mm -hmm. And the result of this was that it got an award from the American, the, the what is it called, the um, Association of American Historians. It got an award for accuracy. Oh, wow. Which, you know, for a good girl like me, that was like <laughs> getting an A. So the, the, <laughs> in the, history. the brothel for women, was that was such a thing documented? He or said it was plausible, plausible, and that's all I needed. Okay. I, I One mean, of the fun things for people from Australia about Monterey is that there's a building on the corner of one of the of one of the streets that um, a couple from Australia they brought all of the wood, they brought all of the everything they needed, including all of the nails from Australia to Monterey. And they built this large building that, for a long time, when they had it, was a hotel. And then for a while later, it was a theater. But it's still standing. They haven't decided what to do with it. But Did, it's been there since the early 1850s. Interesting. Did they bring the eucalyptus? I, I they when, could have. I, I wonder I when that know. arrived. They might have. I remember there There's is plenty a... plenty of them. The, the, the things that arrive, the historical details are interesting about the appearance of oranges for the first time and the appearance of, there's a whole slew of anvils that mm -hmm. get d delivered 
Do you talk about those kind of things you came upon in research? And yeah, well, some um, one of the great things for me is that Jean's customers do all kinds of things, and some of them are sailors. And so I looked up, you know, where sailors coming to the to California might come from, and it was amazing how long their trips would have been, mm -hmm. and what would have been in the hulls mm -hmm. of the boats. And that's that was. Um, the, the, the boat that came that was full of anvils and all kinds of things like that, that's, that was true. Um, and then some of her uh, clients are cowboy types. Um, some of them are local businessmen. She, um, she has all different kinds, and most of them are quite nice to her. In the, in the researching, are there times when your instinct has been confirmed by subsequent research, um, where, where you have a sense of what's likely and then that is proven right by the, for example, by the historian, um, okaying what you'd written, mo some of which you must have imagined as being historically accurate. Surely you can't have done, s I mean, the difference between, let's talk about the difference between history and mm -hmm. historical fiction, for example, um, how historical fiction is a different creature than than history itself. Well, yeah, because historical fiction is about how it felt to be at this particular mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you have to imagine um, the inner lives of your characters. But I love to do research. And so when I was writing the Greenlanders, I, did, I read everything I could possibly read. I went to Greenland. I read all of the sagas. Um, I. I tried really hard to make it accurate. Mm -hmm. And then it turned out, and this was the great piece of luck for the Greenlanders. So after I graduated from college, um, my husband and I went to Europe. And one of the things we did when we first got there, since he was a, had majored in medieval history, was work on an archaeological dig in Winchester. And we met a couple there. Um, who were both planning to be actual archaeologists. And they were so dedicated. And I remember there was a tanning pit that had to be dug out. And so they were the ones that dug out the tanning pit. And he, in a tanning pit from the Middle Ages, is full of shit. And he held her by the ankles, and she did the digging. And it took them about a week. <laughs> wow. And they lived, they, we, all, we were given a room uh, to live in with a bathroom. They lived in a tent. And they didn't want to bother to um, take any baths or showers while they were doing the tanning <laughs> pit. I mean, they were incredibly dedicated. And then when I was, so it was about 10 years later that I was doing the Greenlanders. And he had become an archaeologist specializing in Greenland which is a total piece of luck. And so I showed the manuscript to him, and he suggested this, and it okayed that. And um, it was kind of like the same with the dangerous business. I always, always try to find someone who's an expert mm -hmm. and have them read through. Mm -hmm. I, it reminds me of the first time I was in conversation with Jane. I think my first question was, Jane, I understand you worked in a in an excavation of a archaeological dig. And I'm wondering if that writing a novel is in any way akin to the experience <laughs> of uncovering things and exploring in an archaeological dig. And she looked at me and she said, no. <laughs> <laughs> so that way I thought, uh-oh, I'm, I'm in trouble here. <laughs> You've never been in trouble with me. <laughs> um, can we talk about, about the, the role of, we talk about the Greenlanders, which Jonathan Franzen often mentions as one of the great unsung, I mean, it's sung enough, but, but, but um, that should be it's more. It's hard to read. It's hard to get used to because of the prose style. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it's an ambitious an, an ambitious undertaking and not the easiest read, but certainly fascinating. Can you talk about the role that landscape plays as kind of a character mm -hmm. in novels like A Thousand Acres and, um, and A Dangerous Business and The Greenlanders and 
Others? Well, the thing that I, you know, the thing that novels are really good at and that come automatically to novels are psychology, characters, plot, um, suspense. Mm -hmm. um, but t for me, it's very important that the reader be able to picture where it's taking place. And that's one of the things I loved about David Copperfield when I read it, because there's a scene where David is um, walking across a big um, open area in England, and I could picture it in my mind. Later, when I went back to England, or when, when I went to England and looked around, I realized I'd pictured the wrong thing. But that's OK, because I pictured what made me want to keep going. Mm -hmm. Um, when I wrote 13 Ways of Looking at the Novel, I, they, I, I made up this kind of the triangle of the novel. and has four levels. And the bottom level, where the door is, is language. Mm -hmm. um, the second level is plot and character. And that's where, say, exciting novels like Murder Mysteries, that's what they focus on. The, the level above that, the literary level, is theme and um, land, not landscape, but theme and setting. Because the theme always changes according to the setting. You could not have Don Quixote here um, and have it be just exactly like Don Quixote in Spain. And then at the very tip top, that's complexity. And when I did that analysis, I realized that you can have some parts that are more complex than others. It's very rare to be able to ha have all of them be equally complex. Um, so, for, so setting interests me because it, it develops the theme. But it, always interests, it also interests me because I really love to look at landscapes. I love to look at different places. I love to go for walks. I love to notice how different, you know, a, a spot that's over here is from a spot that's over here that's a half a mile away. Now that's one of the great virtues of California. In, in Iowa, you had to be it had to be like 20 miles away, but in California around Monterey, a half a mile is plenty to make you feel like you've just been airlifted into a whole different spot. And having traveled with you a little, I know how, what a visual being you are <laughs> and how you respond to the landscape. And I can imagine how that gets transported through your consciousness onto, onto the page. And I, I wonder, I mean, you talked a little bit about Dickens and how from him you learn a sense of uh, how to dramatize and how to be transported into a setting. I wonder what other writers you might talk about that you've learned particular things from, like, I don't know, Trollope or Zola or... Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, yeah, I learned from, I would say that from Jane Austen, I learned about relationships. Um, not relationships that are harsh or passionate, but just relationships that are thought through. And I, I mean, I grew up reading Jane Austen. I adored her books. We didn't study them in school. And I took her as my model for you know, how to get along with mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't come to Trollope until pretty late. But when I got to Trollope, I saw, I, I call him the king of ambivalence. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he'll write 500 words about a decision that, say, Dickens would have made in a snap mm -hmm. like that. And I think that's really interesting about Trollope and also very insightful um, of him. The other great thing about Trollope is that there's a lot of evidence that as he, after he got married and as he continued writing, um, he would show the manuscripts to his wife. And if you read his books sequentially, you can see that he becomes much more um, insightful into the minds of female characters. And it's really clear mm -hmm. that he was paying attention to what his mm -hmm. wife suggested and that his wife was a big influence in his work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I love Dickens for the language. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I love Zola, Emil Zola, uh, uh, for his willingness to try uh, to investigate all different types of people. Um, and different aspects of society, yeah. maybe? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I also love Dick Francis, mm -hmm. you know, because there's all those horses, but mm -hmm. he knows what he's talking about mm -hmm. psychologically, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. um, and I loved Agatha Christie when I was growing up. That's, those were the mysteries that I read. Dick Francis is quite well known here, but not, not so much in the States for some reason. Um, it, it also occurs to me that for someone who writes fiction, my sense is you didn't have an overly traumatic, strange childhood to draw upon. No. And yet in, I mean, I guess you had King Lear to draw upon for A Thousand Acres, but you, where, do you, where do you mind to come up with the, the drama and um, Strom and Drem, whatever that expression is? Storm and Drom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, for the Greenlanders, the drama is in what's going on in their environment, mm -hmm. but it's also in the sagas. And I read so many mm -hmm. sagas that it was natural for me to think about <coughs> their world from the saga-esque point of view. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then for Liddy Newton, which is one of my favorites of my book, of my books, um, I was in Washington, D.C. with my daughter, who, who at that point, I think she was about 12. And that was the time of the Oklahoma bombing. And so I called her dad to tell him, and he was a specialist in American history. And I called him to tell him that in Washington, it didn't seem like anything bad was going on, so, so please don't worry. And then I said, OK, if I want to write a book about violence in American history, where should I set it? And the first word out of his mouth was Kansas. Now, if you come from St. Louis, you do never, ever, ever think about Kansas. <laughs> Kansas is behind you. <laughs> but then I started reading up on the 1850s problems in Kansas, and I thought, wow, this is really fascinating. And I hadn't read any kind of books that were about that. One came out not too long before um, uh, Liddy Newton. But then I visited Kansas, as I always do, and I got really interested in those pre-Civil War conflicts. So. Um, you know, I get curious about something, I read about it, and I try and think up a story that will include as much as it can. Mm -hmm. In the green room, we were talking a little bit about the notion of luck, whatever that entails. Yes. And I was, <laughs> and I was thinking, I kind of have a trick question. How many, how many of your novels have luck in the title or a only one? Oh no, there's some luck. Excuse me, some luck. That's some. Um, the first volume of right. the trilogy. So, and then there's one coming out in April uh, called Lucky. And it occurs to me there's also one that has luck in the title that um, you might not think of immediately, which is A Year at the Races, <laughs> which has a much longer title at the end of a, a story of money. Oh, that's true. And ends yes, with luck. It has a subtitle <laughs> yeah. about so, luck. Um, so, Talk a little bit, bit about how luck um, operates in the context of life and maybe and the novel um, as a form and as getting from A to B in a novel. Well, I don't know if I can. If I, I, I just know that I was... I often think about my own life and I think how lucky I've been. Um, and some some of my luck has been just normal luck, good health, mm -hmm. you know. And you won a Pulitzer. I, that, I mean, yes. that was oh, earned, absolutely. but yeah. it's still a crapshoot. Yeah, shoot. and that was that was a piece <laughs> of luck. But having kindly parents, and I mean, kindly grandparents, and people that were, you know, tr treated me well, all that was good. Um, but I wondered. What would it be like to write a, a book about 
being lucky. Mm-hmm. And so I decided to write um, an alternative version of my autobiography um, in which the, the main character is exactly my age, or she's actually about six months older than I am, but goes to the same school I went to, grows up in St. Louis, but becomes a musician rather than a writer. And I, because I wanted to use her life to explore the idea of what would be lucky and, and how she would show her gratitude for that. And it was, t- it was totally fun to write, I have to say. And I wrote s- the lyrics of so many songs that I put in it. Oh, wow. It was really fun. It was really uh, fun. And it seems to me as though you certainly had heaps of fun um, writing um, the Paris book. Yes, um, and also Moo. And Moo, a lot of fun. <laughs> but also there is sort of an energy and... Uh, it looks like you had fun writing a dangerous business, I'm guessing. I did, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's kind of a treat to have had three novels in a row that have seemed to have a propulsion and a, a sense of joy in the writing of them. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, the only novel that I ever really had a hard time with um, and, and became frustrated with was um, the novel that I wrote about my my grandfather's older sister who it's called um it's not called good faith it's called oh um in the i have the whole list here so it's not in the trilogy no it's right it, before the trilogy it's it's good faith no. no it's horse heaven it's not liddy newton it's private life private life um, so my grandfather's... Imagine not being able to remember your books. But, you know, I'm sorry I can't do that. But no. sometimes I run down the list and I said, no, what the... Do you sometimes sit in bed and, like, run through the list? Of... Yeah. <laughs> What's wrong with me? But um, that book was inspired by... My grandfather was one of ten children. There were four girls and then there were six boys. And he... Um, and this, this... One of his sisters... And I don't know why this was. I, maybe she was just one of those plain girls, but she got married off to, they came from central Missouri, and she got married off to a guy who turned out to be a legendary um, crackpot. Um, lived on Mare Island in California, and he was a physicist. And he was brilliant in some ways, but he was totally convinced that Albert Einstein was dead wrong and that all of his theories were right. And you could see that everybody in his business who knew him was trying to push him aside, but he never shut up about it. And I thought it would be really interesting to, mm-hmm. to re- write a book about what it would feel like to be married to this guy. But it the wasn't real easy. Guy. No, it wasn't easy. The real guy that, it, that he was based on, actually after my great aunt died, he went to S- Stockholm and showed up at the uh, Nobel Prize place and, and said, are you going to give me the Nobel Prize? Can I, can I give you a, a talk? <laughs> so they got dressed up and they let him give him the talk but they didn't give him the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and so about three years later, he went back to see if he could convince them. And they were so sweet to him, they allowed him to give the talk. But this time, the only people in the audience were the land, were the uh, uh, grounds crew. The scientists themselves didn't want a thing to oh. do with this. <laughs> <laughs> but so it fascinated me, this, this crackpot fascinated mm. me. I mean, we talk about Australia historically from s- certain perspectives as the mm. lucky country, and certainly you live in Carmel Valley in California, oh, yeah. which is a version of a lucky country. Mm-hmm. And um, we haven't talked about America particularly, and we have maybe a minute or so before we take questions. Yeah, I love um, questions. Um, so hesitate. think of any questions you have. Um, uh, but it feels like America's luck is running out a little bit, and... Um, how does it feel being 
in this moment in time, an American and an American writer? And do you feel any sense of duty as a writer to do stuff or write stuff? Or how does that sort of reside in your body? Well, I've written political stuff before. Um, I don't know that, you know, you've got to do it. Dickens did it. Trollope did it. You know, you just have to do it. Mm -hmm. So at least so there is a record that somebody was paying attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but whether it's what's going to happen, nobody knows. And, and we can only, only hope for the best. And oh, that's all on, I can say. On that note, um, I think we have roving microphones. Um, so any questions you have, please ask them. Try not to um, ramble on too long and <laughs> make sure you form a question. Try not to promote your own novels too much. Um, oh, but you can promote a little You can. Bit. Adrian Todd Zuniga, <laughs> from, who's actually here from America in Melbourne, and does a, uh, a... Tell us just very quickly... Um, what, what you do in the world before you ask your question. Uh, I host a show called Literary Deathmatch. Uh, Jane is a champion and a <laughs> former judge. Um, and uh, yeah, it's four authors read their own work. You're going to be invited to do it in May, David, so uh, I, I was going to tell you privately. But, um, and then we have celebrities judge them in a really funny way, and then it ends in a uh, finale. Um, it's Jane, fun. Do you remember what finale you won? Was it a spelling bee or... I don't remember off the top of my head. I don't remember. Okay. I Sorry. remember that she, she was she kind of a She can't remember champion. her 20 books. Mm. I mean, how is she going to remember something that happened seven it years ago? sounds terrifying to me, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I was just wondering, like, I, first of all, I'm from St. Louis. I don't know if... Uh, I, I do remember that. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, and I'm, it's exciting that we can talk about it later. Anyway, um, we, like, because you've written so many books, I just wondered, like... How do your ideas work? Like, how do you do? You say, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write about this someday," or do you go, mm -hmm. "Oh, that's next"? Or and just, I mean, we all have ideas mm -hmm. that we abandon or keep or whatever. Could you just talk about that process of what you decide to do and how it operates? Well, my ideas all work differently. So, um, I each each book came to me in a different way. Um, the uh, the Greenlanders came to me because I read all the sagas and, I, and nothing really said what happened to the end of the Greenland colony. And I'd been obsessed with um, the end of the world, you know, since I was 11 or 12 when I, you know, when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened and I said to my stepfather, um, so if they, sh if they send the nuclear bombs what are we going to do? He said, we're just going to stay right here. We're not going to, it's, it's pointless to try and escape. He told that to a 12-year-old. Are you kidding me? And when Trump invades California? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't have any weapons. But um, So each one has come to me differently, but what it, what it all, what each one gets going in me is curiosity. So when I, I bought a horse um, who, and I looked him up on the uh, web, on the um, racehorse register. register, and he had been in 52 races, and he was really well bred, and I said, wow, I need to write about horse racing. So I, so I started going to the track all the time, and I started being really interested in horse racing. And for God forbid, I started breeding my own racehorses. And so that's how Horse Heaven got going. It's all about, it's all about curiosity for me. It's, all about, it's not about my own experiences or trying to make sense of them. Although, <coughs> in good faith, which is about a realtor, my husband, um, when I first met my husband, he had... Which husband? Jack. My current husband. <coughs> There's been more than one, sorry. Yeah. Um, he had been a realtor back in Pennsylvania before he moved to California, and he'd had a partner who cheated him out of everything. And he could not get it out of his mind. And I said, honey, 
This is what we're going to do. <coughs> we're going to write a novel about it. Because if you make logical sense of it, it will, you can put it away. And lo and behold, we did. Good faith. Made sense of it. He put it away. Wow, I didn't know that story. Um, next, next question, anyone? No one's asked about AI yet, and I haven't mentioned <laughs> it. I'm not going to ask about AI. <laughs> um, I'm interested in how COVID is starting to pop up in literature in the last year or so, and I wondered whether um, your experiences were um, in any way likely to prompt you to write um, with that as a theme or... Um, whether it well, actually, I have written a book that's just a manuscript at this point that takes place during the COVID experience. And it was fun. It, and it was an experiment, too. All of my books are experiments. And this experiment was that I was walking on a local trail, and there was a guy that I didn't realize was behind me, and then I heard him, and I sort of got startled, and I turned around, and he was just a big tall guy with kind of a paunch, and he didn't look threatening or anything, but I, I remembered being startled by it. And then when I got home, um, I thought, okay, I'm gonna write a, I'm gonna try an experiment where I write a book that starts with this incident, but I'm not gonna make a plan, I don't know where it's going, and I'm just going to go by, go do it day by day, a thousand words a day, and then see where it goes. And I kept to my own rules because I'm a good girl and I always keep the rules, keep to the rules. And it was fascinating. I I didn't know what was going to happen to this woman. And I just went through the manuscript a couple of weeks ago. I thought that works. I don't know if anybody else is going to ever think that, but I thought that works, and I can't believe that I didn't have a plan. Well, I, I love it that you are open to experimenting. I mean, most writers, I mean, I write in a totally organic fashion, allowing things to unfold, and that's how I do it, and that I can't imagine it doing another way. But you've done, I'm, I mean, Moo you had, I remember you talked about having a, a sort grid, of graph, yeah. a grid of... Of, of the plan of that, and then you uh -huh. superimposed other mm -hmm. plots on top of what you're writing, and then now you, and you've written something totally allowing it to unfold of mm -hmm. its own accord. Um, I think that's fascinating that you're open to all those options. Um, sorry to take over your answer. Um, any other questions? The, I'm sure the lady who knows about Icelandic sagas must have a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't got one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any, anyone else? We have, a, we have a few minutes. Todd, do you have one more? I, I mean, I always have. Yeah. G <laughs> just give, give him the microphone. It'll work fine. Uh, I, OK, I'll take it back. Um, OK, uh, just to follow on, um, yesterday Richard Ford was here, and he's written the Bascom novels, and he's written five of them. And it was really interesting to hear him should not expect to continue that story. And I wondered uh, two things. I wondered in terms of process, like when you've decided you're gonna write a book besides the one you just described, but like when, you, when you're planning, how long does that take, whatever? Uh, how do you go about doing that? And then secondly, have, have you ever thought about sequeling in a way where you would be like, I'm gonna write five books about this, or even, <laughs> you know, several. Well, uh, the, concerning sequels, yes, I did plan for my YA books. There's three in one group and five in the other group, and I planned that because I wanted these girls to grow up and learn stuff book by book about the horses. Um, for the last 100 years trilogy, I wanted that to be one volume. I didn't want it to be a trilogy because I wanted it to go year by year. And my plan was that each year was about the same length as the year before. And your publisher said you need to write a book that people can carry. <laughs> <laughs> so I was willing for it to be a trilogy. But for me, all the, everything, every plan is different. You know, My plan for 1,000 Acres was to follow King Lear as closely as I could. 
my plan for the Greenlanders was to put the reader into the minds of these alien people. Um, it was, I'm sorry, I have a sort of sore throat, so that's why I have a lo lozenge in my mouth. But um, when I read the sagas, I noticed that people didn't say, last night I dreamt about blah, blah, blah. They said the, the grammar was, last night it dreamed me. Mm. And I realized that in those in the medieval Greenland era, people thought everything came from outside of themselves. And I had to keep that in my mind as they were um, relating to one another and telling their stories. Um, Mu, I just wanted that to be a school year, or mostly a, mostly a school year. So I started in September and just went month by month and had things, various things happen. But I like it. I like it that way. I mm -hmm. like it to vary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you can interrupt. I just, I, last thing I want to ask is, like, what's the best writing advice you've ever gotten that's helped you? And then also, what's the writing advice you give uh, <laughs> novelists in the audience who are you know, afraid to write their next book? Well or aspiring to write their first book? The best writing advice I ever got was from Leonard Michaels, who was a, a teacher at the, at, Iowa, um, at the Iowa Writers Workshop. And I still had my first husband's last name, which was Whiston. And he said to me, so what was your maiden name? And I said, Smiley. And he said, you go back to that. People will remember that one. <laughs> So that's the best advice you've ever got? OK. Well, when, when my fellow students and I were in the Iowa Writers Workshop, we paid much more attention to one another mm -hmm. than we did to our teachers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I guess the piece of advice that I would give students is um, please your peers. You know, mm -hmm. pretend to please your elders, but the, pre the people mm -hmm. you really should please are the people who are your age mm -hmm. who you want to read mm -hmm. your books. And, and it seems like you have mostly written what you want to write. Absolutely. Not what anyone expects you to write or what an audience might be anticipating, which makes for a, a wonderfully interesting writing career. We're about out of time, folks. Um, the the uh, A Dangerous Business and The Strays of Paris is for sale at the um, bookstore at the back. Thank you again, paperback. Um, and They're all both Jane's, easy reads. All, easy reads, fun reads, and Jane's other books, some of which aren't so easy to read, but are certainly available in other forms and fashions in, um, in the world. So we encourage you, if any of the novels or nonfiction works that Jane has talked of inspire you or intrigue you, they're they're um, obtainable, and we'd like to thank the Wheeler Center as well for accommodating this and for you all coming out in this heat, and for Jane, who's a long way from home. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> it's been a treat as always, and she'll see you at the signing table. Thank yeah. you, Jane. Thank you for having me. I, I think this is a very beautiful city, and I love coming here.